whoever you are out there, you know, pray that you be brought closer to your calling and then pursue that calling with reckless abandon. There's not enough time for us to get caught up in things that don't have generational impact. Mm -hmm. So find out your calling. When I'm done and I'm out of here and I'm hopefully very old and on my deathbed and I'm surrounded by people I love and people are whispering asking like, man, like what, what did he do like while he was here? Someone's gonna say he created some things that, that changed things forever. All right, people, we are back. Another episode of Business Untitled. I could not be more excited. I've got my man, Nate Parker. Let me tell you why I'm excited. I met Nate because he was a wrestler. Dave and I, we basically love wrestlers. Uh, if you're a wrestler, you're good with us. And so not only was he a wrestler, he was a wrestler who was given back. He was an All-American. Dave and I were not All-Americans, unfortunately. Hmm. Uh, still pisses me off, actually. I still think <laughs> about it every day. Nate was an All-American. Uh, he became an actor. He's done 45 movies, uh, a director, lots of awards. And now he's got a business called Mansa, which we've heard a lot about. Mm -hmm. uh, but I thought we'd kind of start this a little differently. Instead of kind of doing the linear, I was born in Virginia, son of a, you know, that we've always done. Uh, we like to focus on domain expertise here, right? We talk about how can you learn from somebody, right? So every time I meet someone, I figure, what are they great at and what can we learn? Nate has domain expertise around content, producing content, writing content, starring in it, and now basically in the content business. And so we're gonna start this talking about content and we're gonna start talking about Business Untitled. So we're gonna start with a little bit of a, a brainstorm here because we're 22 episodes in, we're doing okay, uh, but we wanna do better. And we're putting Nate on the spot to be our uh, critic, give us some <laughs> critique, give us some ideas, and so, hey, first of all, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. <laughs> nice welcome. You, man. That was a long intro. <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. Amongst friends. I mean, I've known you guys for, for years and years, so it's great to come on and talk about business, talk about life, talk about all these things. So I'm really excited to be here. Awesome. And I've watched a lot of the show, so. So we're, we're, we're going to go backwards. We're well, going we're gonna to start with us because yeah. we, love, we love ourselves. Well, yeah, what percentage <laughs> of the show does Mike talk? <laughs> well, I'll just say you have to give us the bad shit. Give it nah, to us. Nah, nah, no, no, we want it. No, because you're the professional. Yeah, you know, I think everything boils down to story. Just tear Mike right? to shreds. No, nah, Mike, Mike, <laughs> he knows his stuff. I, I told him, I called him, I was like, yeah, I watch the show. The show is very interesting. I love the dynamic. Um, I call you the referee. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, you, got, yeah, you right. got you got Mike, you got Mel, and, and what am I? Um, which you represent the culture that cares. When you look at the comments. It feels like they're they all say shout out to Mel, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> like, where's Mel at? Mel, shout out to Mel. Know. But um, I mean, no, no I, I love I love the show. I love the dynamic. You got your older white dude that knows a whole lot of stuff. You got your younger brother that knows a lot but wants to know more. And then you have, you know, dad who keeps him on the rails. <laughs> <laughs> I like so it. It's good. It's good. So what do you see in like other? podcasts or, you know, like we're trying to reach an underserved audience, uh, but not just an underserved audience, mm -hmm. but that's our target, right? Mm -hmm. We, this podcast started because Mel was like, dudes, guys in my neighborhood never get kind of financial advice, mm -hmm. never get to hang out with people with network. And so let's see if we can bring that through this podcast. Uh, what, what's the landscape out there? You know, what you gotta. Well, yeah. Well, the reality is everyone has a podcast, right? Like it's not, it's not, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. So if you're gonna bring a conversation to an audience, one that lasts an hour and 20 minutes, you need to be saying things, not that are just important, but things that your audience, your you know, the demographic, demographic you're targeting cares about. You know, so like when I was talking to Mike, I was like, who, who is your demographic? Like, who, who is this for? Is it for the, the older, I'm, I'm not gonna say old anymore, but the more experienced and seasoned <laughs> white dude? Um, or, or for the young people in the hood, like you're from Brooklyn, right? Yeah. Um, are your, are your friends, are your boys, are the, their families, are they, are they watching the show? Yeah. And the answer is no, you, you can't, you can't be afraid to ask them why not. I think the difficulty with, with, when it comes to like taking a piece of content and bringing it to an audience or going to market is that you don't want the bad stuff. You only want to focus on the things that are working, mm -hmm. kind of to pat yourself on the back because it's also insecure for someone to tell you, no, your podcast is whack, it's trash. Mm -hmm. Like you need to do. So you have to ask them, where's you know, do you care about what we're talking about? Are there dry moments where you feel like you want to skip or fast forward? Should we be talking about more current events? Mm -hmm. But I think it boils down to who is the audience. 
You know, like when I talk to my team, like, you know, when they bring stuff to me, I always ask the same question, not because it's a reflection of how I feel personally, but I always want them thinking about, like, who cares? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, you know, we're building a sustainable garden in the hood. And like, that's great. But why do people from my block really care about that? Mm -hmm. What's going to make them say, you know what, that's interesting. I'm going to go and, you know, put some time into that garden rather than go to the you know, I don't call them food swamps. I, call, I mean, food deserts, I call them food swamps. Mm -hmm. You know, because this food is just nothing yeah. you should be eating. But wh why would they rather go to the wing spot than go and eat some cucumbers? Yeah. So I think that you do sometimes have to make it cool, sexy, but at the same time, you have to ask people what they care about and deliver that to them. Yeah. You know, it's all storytelling. You said this in the last, you know, you were talking about Homo sapiens, and you're yeah. like, we're, at the end of the day, we're telling a story. Yeah. Uh, so what is the story you're telling to your audience? But I'll go, I'll go back, so I'll, I'll play the role, right? Like, who is your audience? Like, yeah. who do you want to be watching this? Like, even the people off camera, I see like a young, vibrant audience of, of, of just particularly young brothers. Mm -hmm. Like, do y'all watch the show just because? I think that's a question you should ask. Yeah. You literally have your judge and juries right here. Right. And y'all can't they front. Do, <laughs> they won't be working. <laughs> nah, see, that's the point. See, you can't, they can't be scared. Man, I, I, I'm, you know, I, know but it's I'm hard. Joking. So yeah. you got to pull them aside and say, you know, did you understand what we were talking about? Did you, and you do a good job of that. You'd be like, Mike, no, 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 ETFs. Let's go mm -hmm. back to that. Mm -hmm. um, so, number one, like, that's, who's the audience? Yeah, that's really well said. And, and uh, I think it's super interesting perspective to put on this. And, you know, I think Mel, I def, you know, want to defer to Mel, because really this, in a sense, was Mel's idea to come yeah. together, like the why of this, right? Mm -hmm. So, almost, you know, kind of meshed in with the audience is like, why are we doing this? And then effectively, like, where did we see that? So I'm going to turn it over to you to talk about that for a second. I think it kind of started with, uh, well, I know exactly where it started. It started with guys my age, guys younger, guys all from my neighborhood mm -hmm. that saw me hanging out with Mike, saw me hanging out with Dave, I'm sure Googled them, whatever, and was like, wow, these guys are... Wildly very handsome. They're very handsome. <laughs> <laughs> very handsome. And there was like one in particular, just, you know, he, the one that they, they used to describe him, the one that says he's a billionaire all the time. I was like, yeah. oh, Mike. Yeah, Mike. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I would, you know, from time to time, I took them to the hood. Mm -hmm. uh, we went to Trinidad. We went to, my friends would be so excited to meet them, hang out with them. They got him drunk, kidnapped him one night. <laughs> and, but they, it was always the same thing. They were sitting there like, I want to know, I want to know, I want to know, I want to know. I was like, I can't keep bringing, you know, not can't keep because they wouldn't be opposed to it, but how many people am I going to bring to Mike's house or Dave's house? Or how many times am I asked to, hey, can you have dinner? These guys are extremely busy. Mm -hmm. How many times am I going to set up dinner? Mm -hmm. So it's like, how can we get this information out on a large mm -hmm. scale and have fun doing it. Right. And this is literally what we do every day mm -hmm. as friends, as mm -hmm. best friends, as brothers. Right. I guess Mike is our dad, right? Well, no. In <laughs> age wise. Age -wise. <laughs> <laughs> in days. Yeah. Uh, Uncle Mike. That's what we gotta start yeah. calling him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know, so it's like and it wasn't for me mentally, it just wasn't hard. It was like, this is what we talk about all the time mm -hmm. just naturally so let's mm -hmm. put a camera in front of us mm -hmm. and share the information so it started off as you know just information for my community and my friends mm -hmm. and that started slowly and then fastly spreading mm -hmm. and then i was just saying this uh, to mike last night i went to my friend uh pickles wedding it was a jewish kid 700 uh people there and so many people, Jewish people, were walking up to me that I didn't, I never met before, and was like, "Hey, you're the guy from the podcast. I love the podcast. I love the podcast." So, at this point, I'm seeing it spread past what was my expected target, mm -hmm. and it's spreading. I go to Zero Bond, and people are like, "I love the podcast. I love." It. When Miami, random people come up to us. So I mm -hmm. think it's just a business set. A business mindset, mm -hmm. younger, because younger people are trying to start businesses, and largely my community, but I'm seeing it firsthand spread to just 
everyone that's interested in business in some way, a, shape, or form. Yeah, like a younger demographic, a though, younger right? Somebody that wants to be a yeah. little bit guided and maybe by our experience. Or even people that have businesses. Yeah. You know? I, I think another interesting point on this, and we've talked about this, and I think it'd be interesting to do a live show to get connected to the audience. Because it is it's it is a little bit hard to get connected and understand it. I'm not an expert in data analytics to understand exactly who and what is responding. And it's a really good point, what you bring up, you know, trying to like ferret that out so that we can improve those spots. That my, my big takeaway though is there are data analytics and I haven't, we haven't spent a lot of time using the data analytics to really understand it. Like it was interesting, we had one, clip that went pretty viral because we were talking about how well Indian Americans have done. Mm. And also we've got a lot of Indian watchers. Yeah. A shout out to Indians. Mm. Uh, and so <laughs> again, us, us, we need to take it a little more seriously to kind of figure out what that audience who's listening to us. We know what we care about. Mm -hmm. We're trying to give good advice and, and do it in a fun way to people that are aspirational yeah. mm -hmm. and with a real eye on the underserved community. Mm -hmm. Because that's why we started. I, this thing. I, I think, and I'm gonna. I, I think data analytics, though, right? I mean, you could make them say a lot of things. They're certainly important, right? Mm -hmm. At a big level, they're important. But, but for where we are now, I also think just just connecting with a few hundred, I, a few thousand. I'm all in live, for the. I'm in for the live. You know, because it's gonna just give you a feel of what that is. That data analytics run in one line, but you're gonna feel some of that too. Like, what are people passionate? When do their eyes light up? If we're talking about X or Y, right? So here's You'll our big that. aspiration. In three years, we'll do a live in the sphere. But right now, we're going to do a live in a bar. <laughs> no, we should do a live no, in Liberty Science Center. I'm, 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 I'm speaking it into existence right now. <laughs> we're doing a live in about six weeks at, where's the place? Six we to eight Liberty weeks Liberty the most. Liberty Science Center. We should do it at Liberty Science Liberty Center. Liberty Science Shout Center. Shout out to Paul Hoffman, who's done an amazing job there. Built the biggest planetarium dome in the eastern, western world, western world. And uh, it's where Lil Yachty launched his last album. Drake was there. It's a very cool venue, and it can seat, I don't know, 1,500 people. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I want to get back to Nate. Get some no, more no, ideas. no. Yeah. I think I think all that's great. I think that's it's a great start. And, and I, I've, what's been helpful for me is getting it down on paper, because sometimes, especially for people like us, mm -hmm. like we 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 move on passion, but we have to ask ourselves like, what are the problems we're facing? You know what I mean? And what does success look like? If we know what success looks like, we can kind of back into the solution set, especially mm -hmm. something that can be sustainable. Because the problem is, and Mel and I come from similar backgrounds, is that. You know, we're, we're not the rule. We're the exception to the rule, you know? And, and coming from a programming background, people do what they're programmed to do. Mm -hmm. So if you're asking yourself, why is it that these communities are underserved? If you're not asking that, yourself that question first, mm -hmm. then, you, then this is a waste of time mm -hmm. anyway. But being able to ask asking yourself, like, why is it, one, why is the community that we come from the way it is? Mm -hmm. What are the systems that are in place that are doing their job? And how do we break down those systems? And how can this, this, this podcast be an advocate for that, mm -hmm. right? Because what you have is you don't have just two white dudes talking about let's do some charity and just help some, some poor marge lines. You have someone that comes from that community. Mm -hmm. So the one that's is in some ways is on you to say, okay, this is what success looks like. And success looks like us producing 20 males. Mm -hmm. You know, male, female across mm -hmm. this community. Success looks like us changing my neighborhood with something as simple as adding to the curriculum of the public school. And you're a billionaire. Yep. You call and be like, can we add a class on financial literacy where they show the podcast? You know what? Yeah. Mike's blushing. Right? Right? <laughs> 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 He's a billionaire too. And, He's just, he doesn't talk about it. He doesn't talk it. about it, right? <laughs> Not like Mike, oh, right. ever actually. <laughs> right. or, or also having someone, you know, in the same way that he's picked, you know, identified you, who are the two young ladies, young men that you can bring in here and sit in this chair and ask them what is important to them? Mm -hmm. You know, what are the things that they're facing? Because, you know, like I'm a big, big believer in hip hop, but mm -hmm. I also understand programming. And if there's nothing really counteracting the narratives of where people perceive us to be, then it's going to be very difficult to anyone that, for anyone to look like us to aspire past that. Mm -hmm. You know, we could talk about money all day long, right? And then we could give people money and they can set it on fire in five minutes, and we know what that looks like, right? But how do you get people to understand the, the value of the tool of money? I think that's the biggest difference of when I was coming up and what I was given, you know, like... You know, when my, when my, my cousins and we grew up, they put a basketball in the crib an actual basketball in the crib. Mm -hmm. You don't know what that is. You're an infant. You can mm -hmm. barely turn and look at it. So they actually put a basketball in the crib. Uh, actually, yeah. in different crib. Why, though? Oh, like, you mean your baby yeah. crib. Like a baby <laughs> crib. Yeah. You meant like Not the in house. house. I'm like, oh, no. I'm just oh, yeah. like, where's this going? No. Not code switch. No, right. I'm not going to code switch. Like, you're the one yeah, that's going to save us. 
but Look that's what mom. I mean. But, but then, but then, the, what is the root of that? Like, yeah. like is either escape because you know I always say when I was coming up, it was a great escape syndrome. Like everyone was like, the second you show promise, they're like you can get out of here. Yeah. Like you're in some apocalyptic yeah. escape from New York. You know what I mean? Like you can get out of here because yeah. we know the statistics and we know what we're facing. Yeah. So if we're being programmed by these things every day, even by the people that are charged to take care of us, yeah. You know, in school or teachers or whatever. Mm -hmm. Of course, we're going to make bad decisions about money. We make bad decisions about a lot of things. So, what does success look like for a podcast that has two billionaires, mm -hmm. an aspiring billionaire, and it's looking like you're going to get there, right? Mm -hmm. Storytellers, mm -hmm. right? A diverse workforce because you got people that work here that don't all look like y'all. That's mm -hmm. a big step. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? What does the pipeline look look like? And that's what distribution is. You're scaling the impact. You can go and say, "Come to dinner." They can see everything that they want. Go home and be like, I just want to get rich. Mm -hmm. When money is like not even, the, the richer you get, you don't touch money. Right. You don't touch dollars. Mm -hmm. It becomes this, this mechanism for access. Yeah. Right. Energy. And that's what we don't have where Definitely. we come from. No access. We're literally living in food swamps yep. where there's a liquor store right there. And then there's like a, 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 a mini mart with just cheap Food, you got a dollar store that has no fruit, mm -hmm. and then we're expecting these kids to pay attention in class. Yeah, we're expecting them to want to read the newspaper and save their money. It's not gonna happen, yeah. it's nonsense. Yeah, you know, so I think conversations like this at being able to disseminate these conversations yeah. from a standpoint of scale, uh, and and then being able to have people that can hear like an interpreter, what mm -hmm. this means for us. Like I said, I learned from the last podcast when we were talking about ETFs, you know, what I mean, you're talking about Bitcoin. Every time you talk, I'm learning something, but it's like, uh, what do they say? There's learning, um, there's understanding, and then there's wisdom. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? They say, w Nipsey said, wisdom comes from experience, experience comes from making mistakes. Mm -hmm. How do we erase the mistakes and get people from knowing something to be able to make good decisions without having to go to prison? Right. That happens here. I tell you, it just gives Nate some props to talk about learning. I, I have literally, I don't know when we started hanging out. Yeah, years, decade, years ago, 15, 15 years, years ago. I uh, have learned more about the experience of yeah. being black in America mm -hmm. from Nate, uh, you might notice we're Dave and I are white, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, than anybody. And, uh -huh. and, 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 you know, shout out to Mel. I love Mel. I've learned a lot from Mel as well. But, like, he made this movie, Birth of a Nation, uh, which, now, listen to this. This is, this is a factual statement. When it pre premiered at Sundance, and it won all the awards at Sundance, he put the whole cast on stage, uh, and the producers, so I was on the stage. Mm -hmm. It got a, somewhere between a 25 and a 30 minute standing ovation. Wow. I've never seen anything like it in my entire life. A, a two minute standing ovation feels like it goes on forever. A 20, 25 minute standing ovation, it was just the most obscene good energy you've ever seen. It was just this, this moment. And I remember the night before, uh, he had the whole cast around. Uh, everyone knew something special had happened. And he hopped up on a table and he was given this Props to all the people, right? Mm -hmm. Naomi, Naomi, Asian Naomi, Naomi King, Asian Naomi King, who was the female star and unbelievably, you know, cute and vibrant, uh, and talented. Gee whiz. We had we had a, a a great cast, and they're all there. And Nate is, you know, the leader of this thing. And uh, I noticed two things: a, he gave props to everybody, not to himself. He shouted me out, which I always appreciate being shouted yeah, out. Said, like, like, <laughs> <"Mike, no conversation." laughs> but I thought to myself, he should fucking be a governor or a president. And you, you've got that energy. And so, hey, I appreciate mm. you bringing it to us today here. Mm. Uh, I really thought that. I was like, here, here's a guy who, who thinks about things that are outside of himself uh, and thinks about systems. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. taking that now... You know, 40 movies, direct awards, uh, and now you're doing business. Mm -hmm. So talk about Mansa for a second mm -hmm. and why Mansa, because mm -hmm. it's interesting. We heard it from Kanye in a different way, right? Uh, we've heard it from a lot of people, right, that blacks have created culture and have never owned it, mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. uh, right? Kanye was a little less gracious the way he said it, but he was his, his, his point it's was absolutely real. absolutely true, mm -hmm. by the yeah. way. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so talk about Mance a little bit. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to go back, you know, for, for a moment. So when you were talking about, like, seeing people and recognizing people, um, so many of, of, of our people don't get seen, you know. Um, you know, Ralph Ellison has this great quote that says, when a, when a person goes too long without being seen, they'll soon lash out at the world to remind them that they exist. Mm -hmm. 
you know? So a lot of times we're seeing the manifestation of that invisibility, you know, um, play out in <clears throat> things that put people in prison or things that put people in, in very tough uh, situations. So I, I've always believed that seeing people is, is really important. So like the fact that, I mean, going back to this podcast, like who are the people that need to be seen and encouraged to make a, take a step in a different direction? Because I don't think that you can move into your calling if you're not encouraged to do it. You know, like they say, some people are born hustlers. Like, no, everyone's motivated out of something that happens in their life. Mm -hmm. You know, and for us, it was escape. You know, it was, you know, literally get rich or die trying. Yeah. You know, um, it was this misguided approach to uh, what are the things in the world can, that can get me to a place where I can, you know, really step into my calling. So yeah. most people never, never get to yeah. it. For me, I always say everything I do is a reflection of what I want to see change in the world. If it wasn't telling stories, it would be mm. something else. Like, I, you know, I think people mm. think that I, you know, Love making movies. It's 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 cool. Yeah. Um. But what what I really want to see what success looks like for me is that there isn't a need for this cop podcast right. one day. Yeah. Because financial illiteracy is something that is a constant yeah. across all demographics. You know yeah. what I mean? And that and that's going to take the type of work and undoing of things that dare I say is dangerous. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I think that that's some really profound stuff you're saying. I think what's interesting have, having now done twenty of these and what I've noticed also when we talk about some of the challenges coming out of the black community, mm. role models, right, basketball in the crib, right, mm. because that narrative that's in, in the parents' home is this is the way that the only I'm gonna, way. this is the only way, this is right? The lottery ticket. And and so shifting that, I think one thing I've noticed and sometimes I talk to Mel about this is, you know, it takes a long time to to accumulate wealth. Mm -hmm. the, the news stories like to say, oh, it happened in one year, two years. That's like the lottery ticket version. But Mike and I have been at this for a long time. Mm -hmm. And and I think that's a message. Like if there's one piece of this message that I really like to get through to communities that are coming up, whether it's, you know, black or, you know, of color or not for that matter, it's that, you know, you really got to just keep at it. And, and this idea of kind of quick money isn't really what happens. It's really like you're, it's never linear. You're trying, you're trying, you're trying. And then all of a sudden, boom, one thing pops for you, you know, and you're kind of leveled up at that point mm -hmm. in time and you do it again. And I think there's an aspect from my standpoint being in development where risk mitigation is a big part because it's a capital intensive business. We're mm -hmm. always borrowing money. I talk about that sometimes. Mm -hmm. Learning to living to see the next day is a very big part of being yeah. successful. Wait, literally and figuratively, because in our communities, yeah. living yeah. to see the next day. And I think yeah. that that's something that people don't recognize. There's the, like, not to take away anything from the journey that has guided you both to being billionaires, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, but the reality is that there are also factors. It's almost like if you and I are running a race and I have to run the race with a you know 200 pound bag, bag yeah. on my back and with a cut achilles yeah uh uh and with a um a, a tack in my left heel yeah. uh and with a sniper on the roof mm -hmm. <laughs> uh and with a the, a broken path in front of me mm -hmm. uh and i haven't eaten in five days like all of these things and some people still do it mm -hmm. so i think that privilege is real yeah you know access is real safety like, we yeah. take for granted safety. I was just talking yeah. to a friend about, I'm not even going to name the city because I don't want to, like, yeah. just kind of target a city for, with respect to trauma. But it's like, there are cities here where, you know, they do random checks of kids' backpacks and they have guns. Yeah. And they talk to the kids, why do you have a gun? It's like, well, if, if everyone has a gun and I don't have a gun, yeah. like, bullies here do this. Yeah. So I think that it goes back to, to what's systemic. Whatever sounds simple in and of itself is likely offensive, mm -hmm. you know, to say, all you gotta do is get straight A's. Doesn't yeah, work. Right. Like I worked at a school once where I had a kid who got straight A's, applied to USC, didn't get in, why? Because the school didn't offer the AP classes, they didn't offer any of the things that would give them the competitive edge. So he had to go to junior college, end up being, the steps that it takes, it's like 10 steps to one. Not to say it's impossible, just to say we have to recognize this. Like one of, my, one of the things my mentor used to always say to me, he was like, either something systemic has happened yeah. or we are just actually inferior. Yeah. Like super, so, you, you get what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. And, and, and I think there's no doubt there are systemic, mm -hmm. giant systemic things that are in play here. When I, you know, I'm going to take your race analogy mm -hmm. for a second, me, running race, not, yeah. right? And, you know, you've got to cut Achilles and a backpack and a this and a sniper, right? But... And that's true. And, and the black community starts out without a lot of advantages in terms of like 
embedded alumni in mm -hmm. university systems mm -hmm. or business leaders, right, that, that you know, they, they get into contact with. Or even teachers that look or, like them. Or teachers that look like them. So part of it is changing that system. I'd also say that having done these and knowing anybody that's made it may or may not have had an Achilles cut mm -hmm. at some point in time or had to wear 20 pounds. Maybe mm -hmm. it wasn't 50 pounds, right? Mm -hmm. like, but I think it's important to also understand the assumption that there's a lot of people from a lot of different places, right, that don't even have to be of color from the hood that face their own traumas at times, right? Mm -hmm. And it can be something that went down in that family. It can be about abuse. It can be about just a lot of things. And why I think it's important to say this is because at the end of the day, we want to change the systems and give as much equality on the input as possible. But to some degree, you're dealing with what you're dealing with if you want to be a success, and you need to find a way to push through that. And what I was kind of saying is, and that doesn't just happen overnight. Mm -hmm. That's a process. It's mm -hmm. a mindset. It's being all American as a wrestler, right? Mm -hmm. That's not one practice. Do you, think, do you think wrestling? It's a thousand. Interruption jar, but fine, you're on. Right. It was Love you. Well, good. I was pivoting off the wrestling. Do you think wrestling? And I was waiting for my turn, but <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> Do you think wrestling and the discipline and the success was what gave you the ability to break out of, you know, North yeah, I think so. Hamptons, right? Hampton, Hampton. I'm from Norfolk, Virginia. Norfolk, right. Right, yeah. right. And there were a, a lot of factors. You know, I, I had a very strong group of you know, aunts and uncles and elders, you know, family was super important to us. And I, and I also feel like where I come from, when they see you have promise, you get protected a bit because they're like, he has something that we don't, you know, um, let's pool our resources to whatever that means to give him this, him or her, what they need. They could be the one, you mm -hmm. know, and for me, thank God it wasn't, it wasn't a basketball. I think wrestling was great for me because it was a sport that challenged me to overcome, you know, mental, spiritual, psychological issues every single day. You know, there's this great quote that says, um, discipline is giving up what you want now for what you want most. Mm -hmm. And it's something that it's hard to live by, but it's something I remind myself, like, okay, if I'm to be the one that will progress my, my family, you know, where I come from is the name is big. Like we are Woodberries, my mm -hmm. great grandmother, and, and again, when even when I say Woodbury, that name was given to us at some point. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's only so far we can go. So when we talk about a race starting at a certain point, just identity, table stakes, you know, for for a community. You don't know your great 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 grand. It, it 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 is the line between who we are as Black Americans, and even some immigrant group, immigrant groups that also are Black. And I'm a big advocate of like connecting the diaspora for that reason, right? Mm -hmm. Culture, identity. Yeah. You have power in that. Um, but wrestling for me was absolutely a tool that was helpful because it became. It took everything that I learned about standing up as a man in the face of adversity and actualized it and it put it into something that if I only can overcome the person in front of me, I'll be one step closer to getting a scholarship and then getting that scholarship. I'll be one step closer to putting my family in a better position. Um, but, but along the way, there's, there's no hiding in wrestling. It's, you know, you stand in front of another person um, and the person that is the most prepared will, will usually come out on top. And again, going back to safety, you know, it was a, you know, a predominantly, pink sport mm -hmm. it, it wasn't just a bunch of people that looked like me you mm -hmm. know um and so even the way I had to move in that circle to be able to survive mm -hmm. you know I went to a different school my, my my senior year where I was one of very very few but from that from the second I realized I remember my I'll tell a, I'll tell a story about one of my uncles um whom I love he said to me you know so I was playing football and I wasn't getting any bigger and I was like 120 something pounds mm -hmm. He said, uh, I'm like, I don't know if I should tell the story. I'm gonna tell it anyway. He was <laughs> like, he was like, yo, so you ever think about wrestling? I was like, wrestling? Because you know, we come from yeah. wrestling, the yeah. singlets, they wear the bathing suit. Like, yeah. what is that? Yeah. And he was like, no, listen, you get on a mat with a white boy and you and, and you throw him down. Uh -huh. You're awake. Uh-huh. <laughs> I'm like, okay. He's like, and most of them are white boys. Mm -hmm. You know you're gonna be able to, you know what I mean? It was yeah, this yeah. thing of like. <laughs> Taking on the man, uh -huh. you, you get what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. It's like there's this kind of like feel like yeah. where we come from is the only people that look like us. And we know not necessarily who the enemy is, but we know who's not there. Yeah. We know what we don't have access to. So it's kind of like you can represent all of us, you know, day to day in a space with others that don't look like us, that from a symbolic standpoint, 
or in some ways representative of the oppression that we're facing every single day. Yeah. So that there was that there was there were all these different things, hood wisdom. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I remember there was a big match at the Russell against a guy that was a state champion, and my uncle was pacing the mat in front of everyone with a gold chain in his hand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Real talk. This is you, this you. You win this you, nephew. Mm -hmm. You're swinging this chain. I still got the chain. I won the match. Yeah. But it was, uh, it was bringing <laughs> a different... Think about that. Yeah. It was bringing a different culture to a sport that did not, uh, at the white. time, yeah. want our culture involved. Yeah. I remember oh, that was on a particular team, and me and my, my uh, only other black teammate, we weren't allowed to wear do-rags. Yeah. And I remember being like, but they're wearing bandanas. Yeah. I was like, no, that's those do-rags. You know, that's thug. And it's changed a lot. Yeah. You know, you got your Jordan Burroughs, you got your Jamie Coxes, you got your all the. There's been I this. You know, who Kenny Monday. Glass, yeah. You know who's the yeah. OG change in that? Really, Kenny Monday. Kenny, Kenny Monday. Monday out of Tulsa had to deal with a lot of that. Yeah. When you hear Kenny's stories, right? Because that was back yeah. in the '80s, and you know, Olympic and that was champion. When, shout out, Olymp shout, shout out, to, out Morgan. to Kenny Monday, Morgan national champ, Morgan State Olympic champion, three-time Olympian. Mm -hmm. But um, Kenny, who's a good friend of ours. That was the Tulsa busing and mm -hmm. all that crazy stuff was coming out of there. And, and not to mention tells, Wall Street, Black Wall Street, like and, the history of that that's city. Right. Yeah. You know, and I think he had a big thing to do with really changing how the sport perceived, mm -hmm. you know, African Americans, blacks in wrestling. Because mm -hmm. now it's a completely different that's game right. than when you were yeah, let me, there at, and at, I was at, there. At the DuPont estate, yeah. you know, Foxcatcher. Well, he was racist. DuPont was crazy and racist, yeah. but he he kicked all the blacks out. And USA Wrestling were like, uh, we don't want to lose this money, so sorry, blacks. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, that's I mean, wild. Literally, wild. that's a true story. Now, yeah. that wouldn't happen today. Yeah. Uh, half, the, half our great wrestlers are black at this point. Now we're starting more. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to say even like um, the Nationals last year, I want to say half of all that the um, wrestlers the in the semis yeah. were like African-American. You know, yeah. and you look at some, and again, it's access. Right? Like we saw it happen in tennis. We saw it happen in golf. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And like I said, shout out to Morgan State University, HBCU, yep. wrestling program that is growing and thriving. And I'm, I'm working very close with them. Thank you, Mike, for your help in that. I want to go back to, to you have something to say too? Yeah, I want to go back to what Dave was saying a bit. We had dinner last night. Mm -hmm. So what Dave was saying always sticks in my mind, mm -hmm. right? Literally, like every time I'm like feeling down, because now I feel down about a couple different things, right? I used to feel down about not having access. And I was saying this to Mike last night. I'm like, fuck, now I got all the access in the world to get into deals, to this, that, that. And I don't have the capital that I need, right? Mm -hmm. And Mike said that to me last night. He was like, you're not broke. You're still a millionaire, but you don't have the... You know, to, mm -hmm. if we're putting in a hundred million dollars in a deal, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. And that goes back to me thinking about what Dave said. And I always got to remind myself of that. It took a long time. At one, at my age, mm -hmm. Dave probably couldn't put twenty million dollars into a deal and, mm -hmm. and be like, you know. And but now he could. So it's a good reminder to myself that I'm like you know what, it takes a long time to get there. And these guys, Mike is, you know, 83 years old, right? Yeah. So, and a half. <laughs> so yeah. he, he, but he looks 59. <laughs> and, 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 and on the other spectrum of that, right, I spoke to, so it was good to hear Mike say that last night. He was just saying, like, look, don't, like, it's, it's rough and you can't put in, on everything, right? Be selective and you'll get there. And one thing it hit big or maybe none will, but you're doing different things and two years from now, mm -hmm. you'll be able to put in, or you may not, but mm -hmm. it was just good to hear that yeah. because you kind of freak yourself out and you're like, oh my God, oh my God. Cause you're almost like, and my cousin, I give my cousin credit to this shout out to Arnold. He was like, you compare yourself to Mike and Dave and all the billionaires they're around. I'm not really doing it, right? Mm -hmm. But in a weird way, subconsciously, I am. So I'm like, fuck, I should have... If I could get in on this, I, I would have been... Uh, uh, mm -hmm. And I I just don't have that type of capital, right? Mm -hmm. So it was good to hear Mike say, you're not broke. But in my mind, I'm like, fuck, I'm, yeah. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm broke. I'm... Uh, 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 and I'm, I mm -hmm. still got millions of dollars in assets and, and I'm still... Still got millions of dollars in watches and this, that, that. So it kind of like, it's like a refresher. And my cousin said to me, bro, you got to look at it this way. Where you come from, this is what brings it back to how hard it is where we come from with that 
five hundred pound bag. My cousin's like, realistically, you are finan your best your worst financial day from our neighborhoods is someone's greatest dream. And that just kind of was like such a humbling statement and almost like resetted me because it is true. I come from Trinidad and after Trinidad was Flatbush and, you know, when I'm having a bad day, I'm still all right, right? Compared to somebody in Flatbush or Trinidad, things could be worse. But to go back to what you said, right? I also believe that everyone's struggle and pain is tailored to them. Mm -hmm. And everyone has to overcome their... <laughs> I'll tell a funny story, and I don't give a fuck I'm telling it. When I, a jar, right? You yeah. A jar we got to build up some money for the jar, so we need to cuss. <laughs> so <clears throat> everyone pain is what Dave is saying, right? Like, everyone, Dave has had his moments that we shared that he has to overcome. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter how much billions of dollars he has, doesn't matter how much apartments, doesn't that, that pain you're dealing with yourself. You have your pain that you have to overcome, right? So yeah. I believe, Mike, I believe everyone's pain is tailored to them. And the one thing we can't do, we could empathize, sympathize with somebody, but you can't actually feel their pain. Right. But you feel your own pain, I feel mine. Mm -hmm. So when I met Mike, uh, however long ago this was, gave me this, like, crazy speech that made me feel so fucking good. He was like, man, you know, like, this was a seven seven years ago. He's like, you know, I've been, I've been knocked down, and which he has been knocked down mm -hmm. several times, and he was knocked down last week, and <laughs> I, was, I, was, I, was, I was laughing because I'm like, you're like the comeback king, like, yeah. Whatever it is, he was knocked down. Wait, he grind, 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 grind. Probably lost a couple more grains of hair, but mm -hmm. he overcome it and got back. And I've watched both of them, and that's resilience. But I met him, and this story is so funny. And I have a sad story to tell about something else that they don't even know. I met him, and he was like, you know, I've been knocked down so many times. I've, I, I, like, a few years ago, like, I was... I, I was broke, and I came back from being broke, and I was like, "This guy was broke, like he and came real back broke." From, no, oh, listen, I no, 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 and one day I'm casually just sitting telling this story because I like to tell stories. I'm like, yeah, Mike was broke and got back. And that's when he said, well, you know, I wasn't broke, broke. I had like 300 million. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> but again, that goes, if I had 300 million, I would have been like, oh, I'm, but that's his pain, right? So you didn't <laughs> say it. Let me, let me, let me ask you, that. Let, me, let me like go for this one. I think you said something else really important, right? Which we, when, and you were telling a story, but I wanna talk about also whether it's Mike's story or my story to financial success, right? In a sense, you use a lot of other people's money. So Mike's story was he comes out, he goes to Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs is the most capitalized place in the world, right? Mm -hmm. And so in that context, you're allowed to risk effectively other people's money, Goldman's yeah. and firms, to reward yourself, right? And mm -hmm. that comes with a big responsibility. But when you really dive another layer under the surface and you and you talk not about basketball stars or hip hop stars, because that's not using other people's money in effect. That's your own talent. And you're just getting paid very highly. But in real estate, similarly, right, uh, loans and partnerships are a very big part of this. And I think that there's something really important in this idea that, you know, even when you don't have capital as like you're just starting out, there's an opportunity to get other people to invest in you. It doesn't have to be that you just put away four years of savings and now you're going to risk it all, right? You have to be fair about it. There's mm -hmm. structures, there's experience that comes with that. <laughs> and one of the things I think Mike and I feel very deeply when you're talking about financial success is like I treat other people's money like almost m better than my own, to mm -hmm. be honest with you, because I'm so cognizant of how important it is with that reputation to pay that back. And mm -hmm. so... 
it's something that as you start that practice and that discipline, right, it opens up a dramatic ability to accumulate wealth mm. by by risking other people's money in a considered well, and, way and then going to town for that. And this is the systems that Nate talks about. It is really difficult to find other people's money if you come from underserved communities. Yeah. Now, there are things out there, SBA loans, right? There are programs out there that you've got to look into and figure out how to get to. But like, just like there are food deserts, there are banking deserts in underserved communities. Mm -hmm. And so like this is the this is the challenge and what, what we when I started uh, I took, took over the bail project and I remember googling uh, and I wanted some you know real black wealthy guys on my board because criminal justice is really a racial justice mm -hmm. uh, or a good portion of criminal justice is racial justice and I googled black billionaires and I saw Robert Smith and and uh, Bob Johnson at the time and I'm trying to David Seward, maybe. Mm -hmm. And then it was Oprah, MJ, yeah. LeBron. And I was like, wow, there's got to be. And so I thought to myself, okay, blacks tend to millionaires. And I, what I realized was there is a dearth. Uh, it's growing quickly. But it's, but it's also reflexive, right? If they believe it, the more you believe it, the more opportunity will be there, right? Agreed. You know what I'm saying? It's reflexive. It's like the system is one thing, but then changing the system as a young black person and being and asking that question, understanding that that is what well, you it's, need it's, to, it's, it's, to it, accumulate even wealth. In the, even in the seven years since then, you've seen a big change, mm -hmm. right? You 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 have seen things like Manson, which we're going to get around to talking about. You've mm -hmm. seen people say, "How are we going to get access to capital markets? How are we going to get access?" Yeah. It's still a it's still a grind. It, We're in early stages of it. It is, but uh, it starts, it's both places, right? Because you have to be able to be in Mel's position, Larry Mora's position, mm -hmm. Nate's, you yeah, know, exactly. like with, no, no, with no, Mensa and yeah. ask that question. I'm sure you have investors in Mensa, right? 100%. There's an example. Let's talk about that. That's yeah. a good way to get into yeah, that. Yeah, it, it absolutely is. Yeah. And I think that we have to remind ourselves that there's a difference between being the rule and being the exception to the rule. And I think sometimes as a successful person, you have this you're almost encouraged by others, yeah. specifically people not in your community, to embrace this idea, if you did it, everyone can do it. And it's just not true. Um, a lot of, and, we'll, and this will lead right into Monza, a lot of my everyday is around, when I'm done and I'm out of here, and I look around and I'm hopefully very old and on my deathbed and I'm surrounded by people I love, uh, and people are whispering, asking like, man, like, wh like what did he do? Like while he was here, someone's gonna say he broke down some of those systems, or he created some things that that changed things forever, um, and and that might be this 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 wild and outrageous uh, um, thought or aspiration. But I, you know, it's like was Jackie Robinson has a quote that um, a life only matters and the impact it has on others. So it's like, what are we doing? You know, I can make a movie every one one movie every eighteen months do extremely well. Um, especially understanding now distribution, uh, and then dying, but all my family is now, you know, all Ivy League, all the, now, now we're having male conversations mm -hmm. and we're money conversations, but that is now my family is the exception to the rule. Like how do we think, change things at scale? And I think the answer to that is dissemination of those solution sets. And there's no better, you know, you know, platform for that than storytelling, mm -hmm. you know, so I make movies, yes, but my, my co-founders, <clears throat> David Oyelowo, Chiki Okonkwo, Zach Tangelo, we, we were, were sitting around, and at some point, the, com the, the complaining becomes this kind of, like, cyclical, like, mm -hmm. circle pity party, where you're like, things are so bad, what are we going to do? Uh, and we looked around, and, and we start seeing the things that were happening. We start seeing, like, subscription fatigue, and people complaining about, man, I got I mean, Peacock now, I got to do that, I got to pay this with Hulu? All of a sudden, and then, every, like, you know, twice a year, they're raising those prices. So it was like, you know, there is no like democratized you know, access to content that is diverse globally, specifically content that speaks to the culture. Cause I'm gonna go back to something you said. They may have, no disrespect, I'm gonna say that to start. They may have the all, all the hundreds of billions or whatever dollars, right? They don't have the culture. Right, you're here for a reason. Mike, Mike certainly doesn't. Right, Mike tries. <laughs> Mike he thinks he really does. Hard. If you look at his closet, you'd be like, he has got the culture on lock. He got Actually, the bedazzled jacket. They've jackets. been kind of beating him. Oh, he's the coming closet. up. Yeah, he's coming up. They've been beating all of us. We need to do an MTV lately. clip. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> but I on. think I think, think they've secretly got a stylist now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I Mental think artist. Yeah, uh, but I think understanding your value, what you do bring to the table, is super important. You're a billionaire in culture. 
You do. You know what I'm saying? Like, and, and, and just, just, just to finish, from the standpoint of your impact on music, from the standpoint of your impact, impact on your community when you go there, but your impact on, on financial growth. You know what I mean? You understand systems that people don't understand. So now what is your job? Yes, it's to accumulate more, but it's also to make sure that whoever the cousin is or the brothers, you're scaling that in a way that is, it doesn't end with you. Because the problem is, if you're, you know, for a lot of the athletes or for all the artists, we heard the stories. You know, they, they, they come, they rock it up, then rock it down. Why? Because there's nothing to sustain them there. You and know? one of the reasons that's why this podcast is so important mm -hmm. to not just me, but mm -hmm. to all of us, because what better way to get that? Ma it's, it's almost like a class, I feel like we're That's giving, right? right? Like right. Th this is one of the ways, one of the many ways Dave invests in a ton of things that mm -hmm. is taking a chance on people. Mike invests in a ton of things that's taking a chance on people, including me, mm -hmm. right? And... I've had a chance to invest in people, taking a chance on people. So, but this is like, I would honestly say, if this goes the way we want it to go, this is the largest way and the most impactful way yeah. that I see us doing that. But I think like the impact of this show five years from now, you know what I mean? Like the greatest achievement you can have is someone come up to you and be like, yo, like start, you know, I saw the podcast and, you know, I started watching it more. I learned about ETFs and Bitcoin or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, I put some money together. I took a pot around the, the hood. We started a little like, um, you know, uh, you know, basically a money bag and we invested together and we were able to transfer in community because of that podcast. That's success, you know, and I always feel that way. Every film I do, like American Skin, you know, it's like some if somewhere some police officer is about to shoot someone and doesn't because they remember that conversation. Take a beat. We take, take a, beat. a beat. Walk away. We save a life, right? We yeah. we win. So what you're saying about the podcast, what we're talking about movies, like all of these stories that we that we interact with, I always say like, all these stories are like a tree, right? If the tree falls in the wood, and no one's around it. Yeah, I'd be a CEO now, Mansa. Yeah, okay, well, I want you to be a CEO. Yeah. I'm being a storyteller, and I'm telling the story. All What's right. the word? Hey, 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 hey. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. I want to hear about tree, Manson. Hold on. If hear about a tree Manson. falls in the woods and no one's around, you know, does it make a sound? And I think <laughs> at some point when you're making films, and those films impact only the people that see them, but there's no way for you to control other people seeing them, it kind of dies on that day. It, mm -hmm. It's only alive to the last person remembers it. Spinning into Mansa, Monster, if right? you'd let him. Yeah, see? Yeah. <laughs> if, no, but I get it, but I get it. So, you know, so Mansa is an advertising supported streaming platform for curated global black culture. So advertising supported as opposed to subscription supported. Um, and just like a really quick like background on how that works. So rather than uh, creating revenue from asking users to subscribe X amount a month, what we do is we have advertisers mm -hmm. advertise to our audience. So we give it to the audience for free, mm -hmm. right? And then we sell our inventory by way of pre-roll, mid-roll, post-roll to advertisers to advertise specifically to our audience. Can you say that again? Pre-roll, post-roll? Not... Pre-roll is a commercial that comes in before a piece okay. of content start. A mid roll is a commercial that plays in the middle of it, and a post roll is something that once it's done, it rolls, right? And which one is premium? Which one is the most expensive? The most expensive is uh, subscription video on demand. No, no, out of those three commercials, if I wanted to have a pre roll, post roll, or what's that? Mid roll. Or, or mid -roll, roll, which one would cost me more as a. It actually depends on how many people on the platform, oh, right? Okay. So as you scale up, you kind of get to negotiate higher. Uh, 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 campaign sales to advertisers, mm -hmm. right? So, like, we had a big campaign with uh, American Express, or you know what yeah. I mean? Like, we're doing something right now with Paramount Plus because David Oyelowo, our, our co founder, is on Bass Reeves. Mm -hmm. So, we kind of cross promote to bring more of their audience to us and more of our audience. So, them. this is a, a, this is a, fr it's it's free. a freemium model. It's a, it's a freemium, freemium model, like Tubi, yeah. Pluto TV, right. Freevee. Hulu. No, no. Who's subscription? The subscription has an ad tier. Okay. But again, they're coming out of the pocket, and that's the revenue. Uh -huh. You get what I'm saying? But yeah. I, I always say the future is free. Like, all, all the indications yeah. are true. I mean, we made this bet two and a half years ago. So I came to you. So I came to, I came to uh, Mike, and I said, look, this is going to work. You know, if, you, if, if we're really looking to create sustainable models, like, this is one that, mm -hmm. like, really democratizes access. Because, again, when you talk about diverse content, when you talk about the global diaspora, and you talk about how content is changing Brazil, how content is changing Ni Nigeria, how these stories are our stories. Right. And when you talk about how, you know, we're, we're no longer the minority, we're the global major majority. Right. 
So what did that what does that mean when it comes to reflecting our stories? Yeah. Like until we take back the narrative of, of who we are and who we aspire to be as a people, mm -hmm. right? Until we're engaged in that exchange of information, ideas, and stories, then we're gonna be playing the same tapes, you know, um, and seeing the same type of stories through the lens of people that don't look like us. Only kind of like a shadow of who we are. Mm -hmm. This is the representation of how they'd like to see us. And that and, and we and that's what we see. So for us, it was like, how can we create kind of decolonize access to the type of content that we believe where we can have stories, storytelling like mm -hmm. this podcast and put it in front of people so it can you know, change the way they see the world. Yeah. Treat, treat me like a, a child in this, but are you, is this more of a platform or more like of a channel, like in terms of how you it's a look? It's, it's, it's both. Uh -huh. So the, the way it works is simple. So you have like, a, imagine if, are you familiar with Tubi? Yeah. A lot of people. So like yep. Tubi is a is a is is a content library, mm -hmm. right? So Monza is a content library. We have what makes us different, we're we're format agnostic. So we are long form, short form, user generated content, mm -hmm. podcasts. Because so we, combining YouTube with Tubi with Exactly, like with that. everything. Okay. So because yep. we recognize that behaviors are changing. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like the average, you know, uh, uh, young person watching the show, and I say from 18 to, to call it 25, watches eight hours of screens a day. Four of those hours are on social media, right? So they're watching snack pack short form. So we're like, if we want to be the future of streaming and we really want to give access to, to younger people and keep their attention, because mm -hmm. again, I believe we're the, in, in the attention wars. I don't think we're in the content wars. Mm -hmm. um, how do we get attention? How do we get eyeballs? And how do we keep people there? You know, we always say we want people to come, watch, stay, and then tell someone else. You know what I mean? Um, so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, a platform where you have a, a content library that is uh, format agnostic. We have a social layer where you can um, asynchronously watch things together, comment on things, so I can be watched. So let's, let's say, and we're going to put this podcast on the platform, by the way. Like, it's going to mm -hmm. happen. We talked about it at dinner, talked about my team already. But if you're, so on our platform, if you go to Monza, and you're watching this episode, mm -hmm. right? Um, there will be like a little menu on the side where you can push and like, heart, thumbs up, thumbs down, or you can comment. Like, I love what he said right there, mm. right? So the people that follow you get an alert. Someone's like, you know, Mel's, you know, watching, whatever. Goes into it, he can see what you said, and he can comment on what you said. So we're trying to bring the experience that our, the, the new viewer is having that that uh, that behavior when mm -hmm. it comes to going from long form to short form seamlessly and put it on our platform. We also have human cur curators that literally scour the all of social media, all of content globally, and bring in the best of TikTok, the best of Instagram, and we have like a linear um, stream or like a mm. like a channel, and you can just watch the best of TikTok swipe. So we're combining all the things that we believe make the experience great. Um, and you ask, are we a channel? So we do also have a channel. It's called Monza Mix. And what that is, it's, it's called a, a fast channel. So it's free ad-supported television. It's kind of like old school broadcast where, like, you, you know the Wild and Out channel? Yeah. You know, you to, where it's 24 hours, yeah, like a yeah, single yeah. series. That's a fast channel. It's like on your Samsungs or your, um, so we have Monza Mix. It's the mm -hmm. best of all the things in our platform. Mm -hmm. We syndicate that out to your Roku, um, we, to uh, Amazon Freebie. So we have mm -hmm. a channel called Rain. Um, so Monza Musa, anyone familiar with Monza Musa? I yeah. Am. Right, Mike. Are you once, the, I was once about the richest that. guy in the world? Yeah. 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 So, I wanted you to. Um, why did I name it? Yeah. Monza, right. So yeah. usually don't talk about it until someone asks. Yeah. Um, I was just about to ask. Too. I was yeah. But ask, so yeah. often we're kind of confined to this scarcity mindset when it comes to you know who we are and what we're capable of. But the reality is, black culture creates all culture, uh -huh. and it's been that way since the beginning. Literally, the beginning. We are original. You know, we're we're not something that came out. We were first, right? J just from a biological standpoint. Where he made so Mansa Musa was the you know controlled gold you yeah. know spices all across the Mediterranean wealthiest man to ever exist. Uh, so I wanted to embrace like an abundance mindset, mm -hmm. you know, to have something that didn't rely on the scarcity of who we were, but really embraced the the totality of who we've been since the beginning of time, uh, and 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 really represent that in in a style of of storytelling. And he was black. Huh? Yes. Yeah, he was African. Yeah, what country was that? Now, like Mali. Mali, the Malian Mali. Empire. Mali. Yeah, yeah, and, so, and that's another thing. So I think that I think that the diaspora is so much bigger than the twelve percent of the United States of America. You know, even though twelve percent of the of the United States of America, Black mm -hmm. Americans create culture for the world. You can go to Japan, you can go to China. You guys are well, Saudi Arabia. There's a massive hip hop movement in the Middle East. Um, so it's just taking all of those th that that uh, export 
that we're yeah. not, we have no, when you talk about like investment, investing yeah. in ourselves, creating a, a, a space and, uh, and partnering with, you know, the, these wonderful partnerships we've had through Roku and TCL and, you know, Redbox um, and advertisers uh -huh. and, uh, and create an experience that is unlike any other and do it for free. Cool. So everyone everywhere can be able to That's watch cool. it. That's like when, when I was in uh, Qatar with Mel recently, people kept coming up to him and saying, Idris Elba, Idris Elba. <laughs> they thought, <"No."> <laughs> 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 they did. <laughs> the question but is, you did you respond? That that, that, that's because you lost that weight. You're looking yeah. good. How did but you respond? You. Did you like, how you doing, how you but, doing? But, but I took pictures with them. There you yeah, go. There you go. <laughs> but you know, and, and Larry Morrow was with us. Shout out for the 10th time to Larry Morrow. But people just, you know, he's got braids. He looks cool. And people were just like all over it's that. Drake. Remember that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's funny. Want to be Drake. Yeah, everybody so wants to talk to But that's to the him. thing. It's cool to be recognized everywhere as a yeah. purveyor of culture. But it's cooler to own that culture. Uh -huh. You know of what course. I mean? Like, we're, the, like yeah, we're yeah. literally the only people who like have our children ed educated by people. The people who oppressed us, you know what I mean, and, and not that those particular people. But then we wonder why the system is broken. You know what I mean? It's like there's so many things that need to be changed. They're only going to be changed through us looking at. You, you're doing no, the math. Go ahead. Oh, no. they're, they're only going to be changed. No, he's about to interrupt. No, no, sorry. No. They're going to be changed by us literally taking back our narrative and then disseminate it to the world yeah. through our lens. And that's what Monza does. Like at its core, it is saying that this is who we are. These are our stories. This is the breadth of who we are. Because mm -hmm. I think that when it's a narrow perspective, then you go to the Middle East and they're like, Braids, Drake. Yeah. Like no one's looking at Mel and being like, Robert Smith, you come here all the time. Right. You know, how but how do we scale Mel? Yeah. How do we how do we scale David Stewart? How do mm -hmm. we scale them? And I think the only way to do it is to tell their stories. In the same way we have a podcast that's about business and, and, and finance, you know, Melody Hobson, who is one of the most extraordinary people on earth. Imagine following her around for the day. You know, mm -hmm. when you talk about power, the power of black women, the power mm -hmm. of being able to move in these rooms uh, and, to, and to mentor people who are iconic, um, she's doing it. There, there are more people than the entertainers, you know? Only thing I would, uh, and I, I don't want to use the word challenge, but the only thing I would say is that we can be thought by... It's never going to be by the people that oppress us, but I guess it would be their ancestors you're talking about, right? So, like, a white, Jewish, uh, what, what, well, Jews didn't oppress us, but whites did. And we can be thought by them because, from my personal experience, mm -hmm. you just, there's good people everywhere that understand so much. There's people who have ancestors that has oppressed someone that kind of like really took a second or and dived into it and understand how much these people in our communities need help. And, you know, shit, actually, his daughter is one of them, Anna. She is a social worker, does not have to be clearly because her dad's a billionaire. Mm. And she has been dedicated, since I met her, she has been dedicating her time and her life to going into these underserved communities and putting on this hat and teaching these kids out of sheer passion of wanting them to do better for no financial gain realistically mm -hmm. because it's what she loves. So that's the only thing I would say about no, that. I, this is what yeah. I say. If the shoe fits, wear it, right? Like, if I'm not talking to you, I'm not talking to you. No, no, you no, know, no. You, I just you, wanted you, our viewers no, to, and I want, to, to, well, to I want understand the view, that yeah, part. I, for 100%, yeah. I want the viewers to know, too. I'll say it again. We have to make sure that we're discerning the rule from the exception to the rule. Like, I'm an exception to the rule. I can, I, I could just say, I tell our stories. Like, look what all that I'm doing for us. Yeah. Look at everything. I, I, I never took the other mind. I always do stories. The reality is, is I'm the exception to the rule. I had access to things even. I had access to Mike. Mike invested in, in, in Birds of Nation. Sure Look at me smiling. You know what smiling, I'm saying? Smiling. He was, <laughs> well, he, what, what, he, what he's saying is true, that there are systems in place that make it really hard. And, 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 and that's, no, no. That, that's the point. That's and, right. it, and it doesn't mean they're not good people. It doesn't that's mean right. they're not kids like my daughter Anna who's out there working the world. It still makes it hard. I agree so, with that, but I but just wanted to make it but very here's, simple, Here's a point I want to make that. about how sometimes we forget where we started from. When Nate got that standing ovation in uh, Sundance and... I was sitting there as like a proud uncle. Mm -hmm. Why Birth of a Nation was such an important movie was in a lot of ways, it was the first time a black guy produced, wrote, directed a black movie with a black hero. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. right? Nat Turner, the Nat Turner Thank Slave you, Rebellion. Mm -hmm. Nat Turner was a hero for the black community. And I remember sitting there. Spike Lee was a few seats away. I mean, there was it was mostly a black audience in the front four rows, plus yours truly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and there was a palpable tears in people's eyes. They were like, finally, we have someone telling our story, and the protagonist is a hero, mm -hmm. right? I mean, if, if you watch this movie, that was only 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Like, and that was the first. That was or, the birth of Wakanda. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, uh, and, and, and it was Braveheart more than it was anything else. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? It's like, this and so is... Yeah. We're, we're, we're making progress, but like, it's shocking. I was like, that was the first time? And then we were like, well, but yeah, that well, Tarantino movie was kind of a caricature of mm. that, right, Django. Uh, there wasn't, you know, you mm. start searching back, and it's not that there wasn't, weren't great black actors and great black actresses and and, and black movies mm. told, but by a black director, mm. a black writer, mm. black producer, and having the mean character being a star, and so that was shocking I, to me. Mm -hmm. And it, and it's amazing to come through that and and. And that you humble that you describe yourself as an exception to the rule. Of course, mm -hmm. we're all exceptions to the rule to mm -hmm. some degree, right? I mean, this country, the promise at the end of the day of liberty is that you have the ability to be the exception to the rule. If you really break down the fundamental premise, the idea of America, right, is that anybody has the shot to work hard. And I agree. There's systems. Look, Do you believe that? I do believe that relative, listen, it's an imperfect world, mm -hmm. but I think if you're looking at the political systems and countries that were founded on an ideal, right, doesn't mean the ideal is always practiced. It doesn't mean there's a lot, and slavery is the original sin in that as mm -hmm. well, okay? But I'm saying like, I do believe it because there's still time and time again where you see people that work hard, that come here with nothing, you know, that that succeed. And that just doesn't exist in places like Europe. That really mm. doesn't exist in many yeah. places. But we've got our India. social mobility yeah. index has gone from like when we grew up in the 70s and 80s. Yeah. The idea of social mobility was here, yeah. and now it's here. And the re the practice of social mobility yeah. has also gone down. And, and you we know have what, less like, people jumping from the working class to the middle class. But well, we're sense, still better than most places. Well, no, but I'm not, I'm not even going to say that. That what's really going on is that that problem is spreading to a lot of other communities. It's really what you know goes beyond this populist movement we're seeing here today. Yes, you're right. In a sense, the problem, so in, the, the problem in the black broad, urban areas is it's broadening a broader, out. It's a broad mm. problem right now. Um, I'm simply saying, you know, you said one. Mike said something to me once, also, which I thought was really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, it had to do with somebody, I don't even remember who, who had like kind of like bucked him over with something. I don't remember even who it was or what it was, and. My mindset, you know, I was like, why do you let that guy still, like, show up to your brunch or mm -hmm. whatever it is or come in, you know? And he was like, you know, I just don't get hung up on negative energy. Mm -hmm. I feel like where I want to be is positive energy and moving into the future. And I thought that was a really interesting point, actually, mm -hmm. because, you know, even myself, I can sometimes get hung up on that and be like, oh, all right, well, this happened, so... And part of that's like survival and realism, mm -hmm. but part of it's also like, you know, just your mentality, right? <clears throat> your mindset is pretty optimistic and, and you don't want to be caught in negative energy. Mm -hmm. You can talk about that if you want. Well, it's also, I, listen, I, I think yeah. often, I was talking to my trainer today about a, uh, an ex-friend who really kind of rogue on me for about two months and then was back to being a good friend. And he was like, and my family was upset at him and I just let it go, and I was like, that was his issue, not my issue. Right. Most of the time, people are doing something really stupid. It's even doing too stupid to you, yeah. it's their issue. That's right. Mm. It's their trauma. It's their stress. It's their background. Mm. It's their, you know, even like the criminal justice. Why do I do the work in the criminal justice space is most of the guys I meet are guilty of being born in the wrong zip code. Mm -hmm. And that neighborhood and that environment, you know, got them into a position where, survival or what their buddies did or because they were you know a young gang because everyone was in a young gang did really stupid things and so i was like i gotta hold that against them or i'm gonna like try to understand where it came from mm -hmm. and it's not impacting me mm -hmm. and quite frankly separating yourself from the other mm -hmm. uh is an amazing technique of staying happier yeah <laughs> like why hold a grudge on somebody no uh, but you have that too dave you guys and i think the reason why we all connected the way we did and you know it's like this brotherhood that's unbreakable is because forget how you guys treat me mike always say uh when i would tell him uh, this one's da -da 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 -da. he's like, super nice to me i'm like that's because of who you are but the w things i see with them and i'm sure you've seen it too 
Mike and Dave literally pass judgment on no one. Mm -hmm. No matter what they have done in the past, no matter, unless it's like some kind of fucking insane weird shit that's like, I just, <laughs> you know, but for the most part, like, I, I, Mike invited one of my friends and his entire blood gang here to shoot a podcast. <laughs> right? <laughs> and he, he just, he's a it, so much people he hired that he gives a second chance to. You know what I'm saying? Dave, same thing. Dave literally do not even want to hear about that shit. Like, I, I don't care what this person's done in the past. To some, you know, there's some exceptions. I want to know who this person is now. Bring him. Let me talk to him. Let me hang with him. So, and that's not something they got from me. I met them that way, and it was something that I just kind of sat back and noticed, and I was like, wow, I've never really seen this before. This is so cool. Like, I had a situation where somebody caught Mike and told him a ton of different things about me, and literally it was just a, I'm old enough to pick my friends. Mm -hmm. Phone hung up. Mm -hmm. I've, it could have been a different person, and that would have been like, oh, my God, wait, did it? Because the person calling them was a person, a, a very powerful person, right? Mm -hmm. But being who he is, being who Dave is, I've seen him, and that's not just with me. I've just observed that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what makes them really special. All right, thank you, Mel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yo, this, this All right, fucking guy. I know, I appreciate. It. I appreciate. It. I'm, a, I'm also, I'm also it's cognizant so of time. We got Nate. We don't have him forever. We got and and like. You know. Everyone's enjoying this conversation. No, I know, but this other two is like an amazing no, conversation. I think, I think it all. I think it's all relevant. You, you got to leave. No, you sure? Because we could replace you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's Eugene all relevant. Eugene's at the door, right? Because it goes, it goes, <laughs> but it goes back also to like diversity and storytelling. Like, what are we telling yeah. stories about? We don't always tell stories about healing. We don't always tell stories about redemption. We don't always tell stories about friendships. Um, we're, I always say we're more than that, or we're that and. Mm -hmm. You know, we're more than basketball. We're more than rap. You know, we have conflicts and we have conflict resolution. You know what I mean? And we do it at the highest level and we do it at the street level. Um, all of these things make up who we are. And for me is to really capture the tap tapestry of who, who we've been from the beginning to where we are now. Because I think that that's the thing that we always for forget. And you bring it up and you're like the founding of this country. We often have such a short-term memory on the why we are who we are, mm -hmm. not recognizing that in the span of humanity, mm -hmm. like these things are just blips. You know, we're a mist. We're a vapor. We're here and then we're gone. Yeah. So what are we going to do with that vapor? How are we going to say that in that mist that, of existence that we had, we actually changed some things, we healed some people, we had some conversations, we had good food, we gave good foods to others. You know what I mean? Like what, again, life only matters in that short period of time and the impact it has on others. So what's the impact? Yeah. What are we doing? Because, you know, again, we can, you know, we accumulate a lot of stuff because that's the biggest difference, right? From where we are now. I mean, you look like even the civil rights movement, like the difference is there are a lot more options, there are a lot more, there's a lot more stuff. And you don't know who the enemy is anymore. Like it's, it's just like everything's. Cha it doesn't change the fact that these things still exist. Mm -hmm. It just changes the way our perspective of it because we're looking at we're in the force, thinking that right now is is time, and it's not. It's going in an instant. Mm -hmm. So how do we spend that time? How do how? Because what they say, you can't put a hearse on a you can't put a um, U-Haul truck on a hearse. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's and, true. And you talked on the last podcast about the big transfer of wealth that's coming up. Yeah. Like it's upon us. It's happening. It's All happening. All this stuff mm -hmm. we're accumulating. Like, this is, like, biblical. Like, yeah. the moth's going to be eating it up. Other people are going to be spending your money in ways that you never would have spent your money. That's the game. Yeah. Um, so th Someone's those gonna things. going to be living in your house. Someone's living in your house. In your bed. Doing all the things that you didn't, you know, that you wouldn't have done. But, again, if that is true, then what does success look like when it comes to our life lived? What is our legacy? What, you know, what, what if, like, like, I always say this. If my neighborhood where I came from or my community looks exactly the same, as it does from when I lived there to when mm -hmm. I died, I have Ooh. failed all those people, right? Like if my community is the exact same it was when I leave, um, and I think filmmaking and storytelling, it's like it allows us to scale ideas very quickly and to do it in a way that captivates people for a period of time and then has them leave talking about it yeah. in a way that's hopefully productive. Really cool that you were able to align your passion with this platform. Mm -hmm. Take storytelling, which you're so great at, Thank you. and content creation, and have a dream of how to distribute this and change lives. I mean, that's really where it's coming together right no now. Doubt. And that's no really doubt. cool um, that there's that intersection of what we're trying to do with this, what you're trying to do. Were you a storyteller when you were like 
12? No, I just wanted to be rich. <laughs> Real talk. When I, where I come from, it's like, what are you going to do when you get older? I'm going to be rich. I'm going to figure this out because I know what poverty feels like. I know roaches and, you know what I mean, perforated steel stairs, projects. Like, I'm not. So, but th th I think that is also a part of the problem. So I remember the narrative of, I was like, how did you become an actor? He's like, well, I had a girlfriend. She was going to apply for a part, and I showed up there, and yeah. uh, some lady came up and said, hey, what about you? Yeah, that's and right. She got all pissed at you, and, and yeah. so you, you didn't even think about being an actor. No, I never would. Have, it, it's, I just didn't see. I can remember meeting with my um, my advisor when I first got to school. So I got a full scholarship to school. I get to school, and I have my advisor. She's sitting in front of me. And uh, she was like, "All right, you know, you know, what do you let's let's figure out these classes." And she was like, "You know, so what do you what do you want to do? What do you are passionate about?" I said, "You know, I'm passionate about whatever it is that you know will make me a lot of money." And she was like, "Well, you know, you can't think of it that way. Right. You know, you're an athlete. <laughs> yeah. You want to start with start e start with some like." I said, "Listen, man, like where I come from, I'm the only one here. You know what I mean? Like none of my family have been in this position. How do mm -hmm. I how do I come out of here with with some way to make money?" And so. Mm -hmm. I got into, you know, like a computer science based, like management science information systems. And um, and it was hard. It was very mm -hmm. difficult to be in that type of field and to have to be a division one athlete. Um, but for me, success looked like making money so I could pull everyone from my family out of the situation they were in. Um, and it wasn't until I started st st like learning about the Nat Turners. And it's funny, I didn't really learn about him until I left my hometown, but he was from my hometown because in our education system, they don't mm -hmm. teach those things. And I started saying, well, wait a minute. Um, there's something here. And then when I became an, an, an actor, I went to, went to Hollywood randomly because, I, I, again, I was interviewing for jobs. And so a girl I was dating, <clears throat> she went to this modeling thing, and I just showed up with her, and the guy was like, you should read this monologue. I read the monologue, and he's like, you need to move to L.A., like, immediately. And his answer was like, because if you remember, Antoine Fisher just came out yeah. a long time ago, and he was like, there's a shift in Hollywood. They're starting to hire black people. And, <laughs> uh, and I came, and then, like, the first couple jobs was like, or the uh, auditions were like, Pimp number one, mm -hmm. smack someone, shoot it in the next person, and mm -hmm. smoke a joint. It was just like, what are mm -hmm. we doing? And I thought, I'm going to start writing. So that's when I started writing. So, you know, I never went to film school. I just thought to myself, I know the type of roles I want, and I don't see them, so I'm just going to start trying to figure them out. Cool. Um, and then I became became a writer. And then uh, and, and again, but I would say the biggest leap that I've taken, the one that I'm most proud of, is distribution. Because then... Everyone that is a storyteller, you're creating a platform for them to have an entry point to telling that story and disseminating that story to the world. Because like you said, your story is different. All of our stories are different. All of our pains are different. If that's true, then why aren't we seeing the diversity of those experiences? Well, the reality is, is we don't own the pipes. It's like anything else. I always get this analogy. It's like, you know, if someone said to you, like, yo, um, you would like, I, I want to build a house. Like, great. You, you know what? We're going to give you the house that you want. Like, what do you want? You're like, I want... 20 rooms, okay, great. You know, where you want it, you perfect location, on the water, fantastic, all those things, right? Like, all right, what else do you want? Gold plated, everything, fantastic, right? So your house gets done, you bring your whole family, because it's like 20 rooms, everyone can fit. Everyone shows up, they walk in, people running through, claiming rooms, all that, and all of a sudden someone comes back and they say to you like, Mel, like, is this a joke? You're like, what are you talking about? This is a beautiful house, like, this is a great house. And they say, well, where's the bathrooms? You look around, you walk around his bathroom, there's no bathrooms. Someone else comes back, it's like, where's the kitchen? <clears throat> you walk around, there's no kitchen. All these rooms, beautiful home, uh -huh. but you have no plumbing. Yeah. There are no pipes. Yeah. Sounds like when I met with Kanye and he wanted to do a development. And he had no <laughs> bathrooms in there. Remember that? We got a big argument about it. I mean, well, where, where's the bathroom? Mm -hmm. But the answer <laughs> to that. He said, uh, what, what do I care about bathrooms? I'm Michelangelo. I'm Picasso. That's like for someone else to figure out. Like, I'm designing a dream. You know, a little bit like that. Yeah. Well, I, I, like, I right. say it. The, the point is, you can have everything and have nothing. Uh huh. You know, you can have all the money and all whatever, but no pipes by which to dis disseminate your ideas yeah. from young people to old. It's like wisdom. I love that. Young people old. Right? <laughs> Did I do that? Did I point that way? <laughs> I'm so sorry. Look, I got the gold coin here. <laughs> he said I got the gold. But yeah. I'd like to just keep it at this point. Yeah. But again, I always say, like, like if you don't have any pipes, they, they say content is king. I don't believe that because I've seen people make extraordinary content, and then for whatever reason, it doesn't get accepted into whatever festival, and now it's sitting on a shelf, and now it's old, and now it's lost value. Yeah. Right? Distribution is king and kingmaker. Yeah. Fun question, Drew, quick. Nate. Go. Fun question. Go. When did you make your first million dollars? What age? Jeez. 
seven years ago. How old are you? I'm 44. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a good age. Mm -hmm. What was your biggest purchase? My biggest purchase? My home. Love I that. love my home. I got a fun I question like for him. You made 45 movies. Give us the, the three ones you look back and you're like, that whole experience was just... Forgetting Birth of a Nation, other, mm -hmm. like you got Secret Life of Bees, you got all kinds of things you were in, stars, like the experience. What movies you look back and you're like, God, I'm so happy I was in that movie. <sighs> Great debaters. Well, I did, I did a film that no one saw called Tunnel Rats, and it was about the Marines that were go through the uh, the tunnels, the tunnels of Kuchi or whatever in Vietnam, uh -huh. and I got to shoot that in Africa. I said yes to that. I was in, uh, I went to it was a sh shot in South Africa. I got to visit KwaZulu Natal, where the Zulus were, um, Johannesburg. Um, I just, it, it was the big, one of the greatest experiences in my life. I'd never gone before. I took the job without uh, um, seeing a script, because there was no script. Mm -hmm. um, and the director, there weren't a lot of fans of his work. Uh, but the second they said Africa, I'm like, cool. Because how else would I, at 24, be able to go? Um, on someone else's dime, but in, right. experience the entire culture uh, or the, the culture of that region, and um, it was breathtaking. It was it was one of the the great experiences, and I've gone back several times since then. I've took my mother and my uncle back, um, and I've spent time in Nigeria. I've spent I mean, it's just it's 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 that job to me was, and I got the call while I was on that job. It was right before I did Great Debaters, and I remember. I said no to everything, so I wouldn't audition for anything because I felt like if it wasn't alignment with what I thought my calling was, and it drove my agents crazy. They were like, you can't, that's, this is not how this works, man. Mm -hmm. Like, you gotta take some stuff, one for the real, one for the meal. I was mm -hmm. like, that's not what I wanna do. I want my grandmother to be proud when she sees something. So I had this opportunity to uh, um, audition for, so when the great debaters came up, everyone wanted to audition for it, as you can imagine. Like, it's Denzel Washington, it's Oprah mm -hmm. Winfrey, it's Forrest Whitaker, it's like Kimberly Elise, like, everyone's um, in it. Um, was Kimberly in it? Or am I blanking now? I haven't had, just had a senior moment. She was in Pride. Um, Uncle Mike moment? I had an Uncle Mike moment. <laughs> Why do I keep looking left when I say old things? No, but seriously. So I'm loving this so I get, So I, I auditioned for, so I go on tape, and the whole time I had the script for like a year before, and I decided I was going to learn the entire script, line by line, everyone's role, even my own, just mm. to, so when I stood in front of Denzel, I could be like, there is no other person you know? So, and this is before I knew I was going to get the audition. Um, my agent was like, you're probably not going to get it. He wants to hire this other guy. And so, and I say this because it leads into the second um, job, the second experience. And so I remember the day, so I do the audition. I go to Africa. I'm in Africa. I'm like touring, eating the best. It was just the best experience of my life. And I get a, a call. And it was, uh, I want to say Denise Chamian, who's the um, casting person. She said, uh, Mr. Washington wants to meet you. So I'm like, dope. So I come back when I get back and I go and I audition for him. And I, I, brought, I wrote a 100-page biography. I talk about this in other things, but and it's like this thick thing I wrote by hand. Mm -hmm. I knew the whole script by heart. And I walk into the room. We do the audition. He keeps trying to trip me up. Go to the scene. Go to the scene. I knew it all. I didn't even look at the paper. I never mm -hmm. broke high. I just was like, mm -hmm. it was like a wrestling match. Mm -hmm. Like I came in and I was just ready to go. I was like, I dare you say anything and mm -hmm. think I don't know it. Uh, and then I got that job. The single greatest experience of my my acting career, um, because I got to, you know, one of the things I wanted to do, I asked him, I said, can I, um, on the days that I don't work, can I stand behind your directing chair because I want to be a director? He said, absolutely. So the first few days, I'd be, you know, sitting behind him, and he wouldn't say anything. He'd do his thing. And I came, like, dressed to the nines as a character, like, just quiet. And after about um, a week, he leaned back and he says, well, the reason I did this is this and that. And I always thought that was cool because now, I'm the actor being mentored as a director by the director who is Denzel Washington. Um, and it was just a, an extraordinary experience. Um, I'd say the next one would be American Skin. Um, and I think because it was made out of the kind of um, the rawness and tumult of George Floyd. Um, and and the, the crazy thing is it was actually it was actually Tamir Rice, because it was before George Floyd, but it was that season right. where it was just constant. And I, um, you know, I adopted my nephew at 13. Um, my, my, my sister had other kids and he was just a, a boy being a boy and he needed a, a man in his life and his father had been in prison. So he came to live with us and, um, and Michael Brown happened and he was like, 
Uncle Nate, like, and he goes to a all, very affluent school, you know what I mean, very nice neighborhood, and he is beautiful, dark skin, braids, whatever. And he was scared. He said, what do I do if I get pulled over police? I was like, well, wherever you are, just stop and call me. And I was like, no, 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 don't call me. Don't grab your phone. I was like, okay, just really slow. And I, and I realized I was traumatizing him with this instruction on how to survive. I was like, I don't have answers. I'm going to get your answer. I went, Michael Brown came back, and then, you know, I started writing the story. Wrote the story. Made it for, like, $500,000. Um, and, you know, did a bunch of research. And, uh, and it was kind of like, um, like a love letter to my nephew. Just to say, I love you so much. I'm going to give you answers to this. It was a very emotional experience. So those are the three things if I have to... And again, it goes back to things that I, that projects that I thought were impactful um, to, to others. But again, when you think of like Lena Waithe, you think of like Ryan Coogler, when you think about Issa Rae, like all of them came up as independents mm -hmm. and it was by a miracle, a divine appointment, they were able to break through. But I just believe that they are thousands of them out there mm -hmm. all over the world just waiting for someone to believe in them enough to platform their talent and that's what Monza is cool. you know all right give it to me we mm -hmm. got at the end of our podcast mm -hmm. we give everyone an ounce of gold dave used to actually pay for all the gold and <laughs> finally we got a sponsor we've got jm yeah. bullion they are uh, the biggest you know direct to consumer gold sale uh, gold seller in america right they're a a uh, subsidiary of A Precious Metals, which is a Fortune 500 company. Uh, they are kind enough to give us an ounce of gold for every episode. Our first and only sponsor, we love them, and so shout out to them. Shout out to shout them. Out shout to out them. To, you talk the about a differentiator. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we had no sponsor, and, they yeah. showed up. This is you, and uh, let, me tell you, let me tell you a little it's, bit of macro here. Gold today mm -hmm. is trading the highest price it ever has in its history. Oh, wow. My mm -hmm, predictions, mm -hmm. since we started, it's going to 3,000. I still believe it's going to 3,000, so I would not sell that at least for a year. Yeah. Uh, I'm and, not going to sell it. And, and with that, we asked for, like, your little ounce of gold, your kind of touch of wisdom that you want to leave our viewers with. Leave the entrepreneurs with the... Uh, we end this podcast with an ounce of gold. Um, ounce of gold. You've said a lot of great ones, but what's your last ounce? Um, I would, I guess I would say, let me think, y'all really gave some gold away. Like, that's mm -hmm. crazy. Um, <laughs> I'm still, like, wrapping my head around this. Like, you really want to have impact, invite someone from the hood, sit them here, ask about the experience, and give them some gold. Mm -hmm. Like, that's real. Yeah. Um, I would just would say, um, find, you know, so I, I lead with my faith. You know this. You know what I mean. I don't tell people what to believe, but you know I'm a Christian. I believe. You know I'm, I, I have my beliefs. They're very, very, very much uh, ingrained in, in who I am. I only say that to say, um, whoever you are out there, you know, pray that you be brought closer to your calling, and then pursue that calling with reckless abandon. There's not enough time for us to get caught up in things that don't have generational impact. Mm -hmm. So find out your calling. Like even for a high school kid, if you're thinking about what you want to do. It's easy to say, I want to make money. We all want to make money. But what's your calling? What do you believe the, the unique calling on your life is that only you can do? Mm -hmm. um, and then think about how you, you know, pursue that with reckless abandon. When I realized for me it was storytelling, I, I, I threw my whole world at it. And you know that. It's, it's what I eat and I breathe. Um, and I see it with you in music and in finance. I see it with you in finance and in future-facing, you know, technology around money and and so it's like, uh, find out your calling, you know? Mm -hmm. it, it's, and then once you get, and you figure that calling out, um, cause that's your compass, that's your yeah. GPS. That's yeah. putting in the address. Then no matter the turns you take on yeah. the GPS that are wrong, it'll always course correct you back to whatever that calling is. You know, when, when uh, I'll select last, end with one story about that. Cause when Nate uh, came to me and said, hey, I want you to invest in Birth of a Nation. Uh, I even read, read the script. And I did read the script because I'm, not a detailed guy. <laughs> um, uh, I didn't read the script because he had such passion. And he was like, dude, I am not going to not win on this thing. You just have to trust me. And we had like 14 Jack Daniels. And at the 15th one, I was like, dude, I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> but again, when you have that calling and That's you've right. done your work, yeah. it resonates. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it was an e I was an easy sale. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If he came mealy-mouthed and said, I'm trying to make this movie, and I, I don't know if there's a lot of risk to it, I'd have been like, eh, yeah. mm -hmm. not so for me. Great ounce of gold. Find great your calling. Gold. Reckless abandon. Reckless abandon. Nate, love thank it. you so much, buddy. I loved it, man. Yeah, this is great. Man. Thank this you. This amazing. Amazing. Yeah. All right, be well. Thanks for having me. This is great. Oh, lots of fun.